2025 has been a wild season thus far, producing some iconic moments such as Todd Kidd's back-to-back Ajax 200 wins, Diego Orchidi becoming the active Ajax Cup Series all-time wins leader in West Virginia, Shane Park scoring his first oval win in nearly 2,000 days at the Stoneyard, and Braden Bennett scoring his first Cup Series victory at Disney in just his 22nd start to snap Toyota's drought. If you want to cop any of those replica die casts, head on over to Circle B Diecast, Last Play and B Sales, and use coupon code ASCA to get free shipping on any orders, $20 or more at checkout. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the ASCA Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Fallon, back in here with another episode, and boy, Oh boy, oh boy, do we have a lot to cover after a wild weekend of action from the Stoneyard. So the final crown jewel race weekend is in the books. We only have three weeks remaining in 2025. Three weeks remaining. I know, that that sounds crazy. We were just here previewing the season <laughs> way back Um A second to last week of August, I believe, and now we've only got three weeks to go. So crazy. Um, This season has just flown by. It's been another incredible year of ASC action and an incredible championship fight that we've been witnessing all year long between Diego Arquiti and Todd Kidd. Another huge race on that championship fight. Of course, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about the Craftsman Series title fight that Seemingly, nobody wants to win at the moment. Only two weeks remaining in that. And they're on an off week this week as well. We'll also be previewing some silly season news to drop and previewing this weekend's lone ASCA event, the Apple 225 at Computer Motor Speedway. But first, before we get into it, we got to shout out to Sports Premier Partners. Rowdy Energy, you already know. Click that link. Um, second to top link in bio because um, the Cup Series most popular driver voting is now open. So you can go over that as well. But click the second to link, second to top link in bio if you want to visit Rowdy Energy and cop yourself one to help you. Stay awake throughout the remainder of this podcast. And then Circle B Diecast slash Plan B Sales. I know that their Black Friday sale just wrapped up. But hey, um, if you want to cop any of the replica diecasts, maybe the replica diecast that Todd Kidd just used to win his record tying fifth victory of 2025, head on over to Circle B Diecast slash Plan B sales and use coupon code ASCA for free shipping on any orders, $20 or more. So once again, shout out Rowdy Energy, shout out Circle B Diecast slash Plan B sales. And yeah, let's get into it. So Todd Kid, what more needs to be said about what the 29-year-old has done this season? What an incredible job. What an incredible driver. And if this isn't the year, I don't know when it will be at this point. Um, Kid has just been outstanding. Um, And the thing is, you could kind of say that he got off to a slow start as well. Like you consider that um, the first seven races of the season, he had only led, I believe, what? 19 laps or something crazy like that he had led less than 20 laps in the opening seven races of 2025 yet he was still right up there in the championship he'd only won one race and that was the um the ajax 200 which he undeniably got incredibly lucky in um with the incident between jackson and ayers you know kid just kind of prevailed in that situation and uh happened to sneak by both of them when they collided and got the lead and drove off and won the thing. But um, yeah, ever since that Windows 300 victory, that really turned the tide and gave the momentum fully to Ronnie Woods Motorsports. And Kid has now won four out of the last 
six Ajax Cup races. And the two races he haven't hasn't won. He finished fifth at Denver, which you know it was kind of off that weekend, but he was sick. He was coming off three in a row. Everyone was gunning for him. Still managed to bounce back and finish fifth. Damn it's a limitation that day. And then obviously a DNF in the Ajax 200, but we know that he and Diego collided. So there's not really much more he could have done about that one. But Todd Kidd, five victories in 2025. And when Cameron Atwood won those five races a couple years ago, I thought to myself, you know, it's probably going to be a while before we see this happen again, if it ever does happen again. I thought we'd see it eventually, but I didn't think we'd see it, you know, just a couple years later. And with the way that things are seeking out right now, Todd Kidd could very well win more than just the five races that he's won already this season. He could win six. He could win seven because we know we did get confirmation that Ronnie Woods Motorsports and Arcadia Bros Racing are the only two teams still working under the current regulations. Everyone else is fully focused on the new regs for 2026. And we know that the turbo hybrid engines will be a thing, but in terms of everything else, we still aren't exactly aware yet of the full extent of how much is going to change from this year's cars to next year. And we'll get a bit better picture as we move closer and closer to 2026. But um, yeah, you get the point that a lot is changing next season. And a lot of teams are fully focused on that. They want to get that right. So with that in mind, kids only competition for these last three weeks, you would think would be his teammates, of course, in Rikidi Bros Racing. So um, for Todd Kidd, especially the way that he did it too, you consider that Diego is, of course, a four-time champion, of course, a 28-time Cup Series winner, tied for the second most victories all time in Cup Series history, in Cup Series history, mind you. He outduels Diego a six-time Stoneyard winner on a night in a weekend where Diego had swept the practice lessons, qualified on pole, led 158 laps. Like you're thinking, if, if you tell any, any ASA fan that Diego is going to sweep the practice sessions, qualify on pole, and lead 158 laps, you'd assume he ran away, dominated, and won that race. And had Diego won that race, instead of it being a six-point gap between the two, assuming Kidd did not lead a lap throughout any portion of the day, it would have been two points heading into the final three races. And then you and you would look at it with saying that Rikidi Bros Racing had all the momentum. But now as it stands, I, I think Ronnie Woods Motorsports definitely took the momentum back. I, it had been a couple weeks since they had broken through. Um, you know, Orchidi Bros Racing, of course, Diego bounces back at, what was it, uh, Denver. Huge, huge win there to keep his title hopes alive and finally snap Todd Kidd's three-race win streak. And then, of course, the collision at Ajax. So, you know, they were kind of, level even packing after they collide in all the talk was about that and then Diego comes out and does what he does at his best track statistically might not be his best track anymore although I'd still say it is just for some reason since 2021 Diego has not been able to close the deal at the stone yard I don't know what changed um he used to you know dominate and close everything out with ease here but now He's had a much tougher time of it, and maybe that's just because the competition's finally caught up to what he's doing, but he still does dominate here. He just he can't close out the deal. I guess that does point to the competition catching up to what he's doing because clearly Diego had the car to be all night, and talking to Diego and talking to especially his new crew team, Sheldon Price, 
they always try to make adjustments. They never stay stagnant. You'll hear them talk about that during the broadcast. They're always making adjustments in the pit, trying to keep up with the racetrack in anticipating the changes. So maybe the problem was they had the dominant car, but trying to anticipate the changes, they outbox themselves on that final run. And whatever adjustments Todd Kidd made, plus him finally getting track position, which he didn't have all night, this seemed like another Windows 300 race where those two were pretty much even, but track position was the main thing. But unlike the 300, Kid did not need help from a teammate. No, he drove up there, got to Diego's bumper, got to his door, and got the lead. And the rest is history. So um, just a, a fantastic performance from Todd Kid and um, there's so many different accomplishments you can list off that he took care of last night. I mean, um, why don't we start with it? You know, he just, he's the first driver in ASCA history to win all three crown jewel races in the same season, Ajax 200, Winders 300, and Northern 200, all in the same season. And if you date back to the start of last year, Todd Kidd is five for six in crown jewel events. Five for six in his last six crown jewel starts. And the one that he didn't win last year's Northern 200, oh, he just went a second. No big deal. And so that's incredible when you think about it. Like Ronnie Woods Motorsports themselves have won Six straight crown jewel events, five from Kid, one from Bryn Redder as his parting gift to the organization. Big race Bryn was a thing for all the crown jewel races he won in that 48. And now you got big race Kid in the nine, carrying that into the next generation. Now that Bryn is obviously with Michael Wright racing. And that's pretty crazy for Todd Kid to suddenly just. Like that, he's magically this big game, big pressure moment guy because he was not that early in his career. He would always crack in these pressure situations. Um, he was 0 for 25 in Crown Jewel events prior to 2024. But, you know, I don't know what, what, what switch flipped. I know he got engaged prior to the start of last season. Maybe that was it. Because we did notice that there was definitely a different Todd Kidd to open last year. And we thought that the championship battle between Kidd and Rikidi, that was going to take place last year. But in the second half of the season, the nine team fell apart, as they tend to do over the years. Um, this year, though, they haven't fallen apart. They're keeping their foot in the throttle. They've heated up at the right time. Last year, they obviously peaked way too early. They won three out of the first eight races, but then won none out of the final eight. This year, though, on the other hand, they're peaking when it matters most. Kid has now won four out of the last six. There's only three more races to go. And I know that there's no crown jewel events still left on the table, but I'd certainly consider the finale a crown jewel event. High pressure, big ticket situation for Kid, especially if Diego is still mathematically eligible to win the title, which I don't see why he wouldn't be. Um, speaking of that, let's talk about the four-time champion a bit because this has to be a demoralizing loss. And it has to be a demoralizing loss for anyone, let alone a guy like Diego. And you can tell this, this hit his ego. You can you take a look at what he said on Twitter post race, talking about that 60% of the field can win in Todd Kitt's car. He cannot accept the fact that he was beaten at his best track outright like that after being so dominant all night. Like Diego cannot seem to mentally process it. And he can't seem to mentally process why the nine team and Ronnie Woods Motorsports have really kind of gotten the best of them 
throughout the second half of the season. You look at the win nurse 300 as well. He was out dueled that night as well by Kidd. And I really think that we are beginning to witness the end of Orkidi Rose Racing's stranglehold on the sport. Um, now, here's the thing. I certainly don't believe this championship is over by any means. I mean, we had to... Belltown is one where I look at Diego and I'm like, mm, I don't know. But a toss to his home track, so he's going to show up. He's going to come out to play. But these next two weeks are going to be critical for Diego. He has to win one of these two races if he wants to push it into a title decider, especially considering the recent run of form that Todd Kidd has showed. Diego has to win one of these next two or potentially both. I don't know, but he's got to win something, man. He has to, because clearly at, as it stands, Ronnie Woods Motorsports, they have all the momentum right now. They're rolling. And Diego, again, is still struggling to mentally process what happened on Saturday night. I think his confidence is honestly shattered by that. And I know that you look at the point standings and it barely looks like kid did anything. You know, obviously only finished one spot ahead of him. So he only gained one point. But that's mainly in part to the fact that Diego did lead a lap and he led the most laps. So that's a loss of an extra two points, which is critical because it could have been a lot worse had Todd led the most laps. But it was a huge kind of swing in the championship because it could have been only two points separating them heading into the Apple 225. And now it's six. And I know four points doesn't seem like much, but that's a lot. And especially when you consider it, how fine the margins have been this season, four points is a lot. So, you know, and then you take it back to the Windows 300. That's twice now that Diego has lost head to head to Todd Kidd. And I think that his confidence is starting to take a hit. And I think that if he loses this championship battle, it could mark the beginning of the end for KD Bears Racing. I know it sounds so cliche to say something like that, and I will probably regret it. Diego will probably come out at age 35 next season, go out and complete his drive for five. But this year, I think that even though the point standings don't show it like they did after San Diego, Diego is on the ropes again this week, and he has to respond. He's got to do something. And by something, I don't mean take out Kid again. I mean he has to win. That's all he can do. So we'll see on that front if Diego can get the job done. Um, at Computer Motor Speedway. We know, obviously, he's won there before. He's never won the Apple 225, though. Ironically enough, the closest he came was 2022, where he led, a believe, a race high 81 laps before he had a late pit road penalty and surrendered the lead to guess who? Todd Kidd, who went on to win the race. So, Jago is certainly hoping that we do not see a repeat of that again this season. That is for sure. But one more thing on Todd Kidd, and I just kind of want to talk about his ASCA legacy as a whole. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's now seventh on the all-time wins list, the highest of any driver without a championship. And Let's be clear here. Even if he doesn't win it this year, Todd Kidd will win a championship. I There's no doubt in my life. He's only 29 years old. I think he's got at least another two to three years in this championship window. We know he just signed a six-year contract extension with Ronnie Woods Motorsports to stay with that organization in the number nine pretty much throughout the rest of the decade. So and into 2032, through the 2032 season, I should say. So, obviously, he is in it for the long haul. 
And um, so, yeah, like kid, he is not, he's not done yet by any means, even if he doesn't get the job done this year. But I certainly believe that the confidence is starting to brew for those guys. Um, they have a lot of faith that this is going to be the year after 10 years of trying. And if kid can get the job done, I think we're talking Hall of Famer status at this point. Already, we're talking Hall of Famer status. And you consider the fact that at age 29, Diego had 16 wins. Todd Kidd also has 16 wins at the age of 29. And the craziest part is he won eight races in his first eight years in Cub. The last two years combined for Kidd, he's won eight races. So he has equaled his win count in the last two years alone that he had throughout his first eight years in Cup. Like he's clearly taken that next step into becoming a champion. And I don't know if it's going to happen this year, like I said, but it's going to happen sooner rather than later. And um, he is truly developed into the generational talent that, a lot of people were billing him as when he first came in in the Cup Series and even when he was part-time in 2015, finishing top five in his starts. So let's transition a bit. Let's talk Craftsman Series. And obviously they're off this week, so he won't talk too much so that this episode doesn't go 48 minutes like last time. Holy crap. That was ridiculous. Um, but let's talk this Craftsman Championship that – Literally, nobody wants to win. Your top four point in the Craftsman Series finished 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th at the Stone Yard. And Tony Delval, man, if he doesn't win this championship, you're going to have to look at this performance and say this is why he lost it. I know, obviously, you can point to the DNFs, and if Domel doesn't have the DNFs that weren't even his fault, this isn't even close in terms of the championship. Like, we're not even having this discussion. Domel is clear out in front by 20 points. He's had an outstanding rookie campaign, and the things that he's able to do at 18 years old, they're special. He's going to have a lengthy cup career ahead of him as a superstar as long as his father – doesn't get in the way too much but boy oh boy was that a brutal speeding penalty for him to take um on friday night that was brutal man and it's even more brutal i think for gunner thorson as well another 18 year old who's gonna have a long cup career ahead of him um thorson if his incident didn't happen between himself and darty He'd be leading the points right now because he has been incredible since that incident. He has turned it on to a new level, and he's been outstanding the second half of the season quietly. Um, he definitely deserves a cup ride sooner than later, but he's on the outside looking at still at this point. He's 10 back. He's going to need absolute chaos, which I mean – we're heading to back-to-back -back sword tracks to close out the year. So absolute chaos is <laughs> more than certainly plausible to take place these final two weeks. But it's looking unlikely. As for the defending champion, though, Graham Darty, even though he finished 11, hit the wall multiple times, he's still in it. Um, like I was saying for Tony Delvaldo, he blew – a golden opportunity, man, a golden opportunity to really drive off and put a big cushion between himself and John Wooden. Um, he was seventh at the time. I think he would have come out six. And we know the outside lane rocking at the stone yard. He could have easily have come out in fourth, maybe driven up the third, second, who knows? And those closing stages, it seemed like he was finally – Starting to get the hang on the track there towards the end after qualifying 14th. Remember, he had zero experience at the Stone Yard prior um, to Friday night. I should say Friday morning, considering that's when he was 
he arrived for first practice. He had never even seen the track before. So um, just getting those laps underneath him, including that cup race, which didn't go so hot for him, but that was all by design to get him more laps at the track in general. And he drove a good race until the speeding penalty. And that might come back to bite him because now we head to the final two races and Dovell has completed a combined half a lap, I believe, at both of them because he was taken out in turn two. You know, his previous two trips to both San Diego and Belltown. So there's no data to really kind of back up how Delval is going to do here. We know that it's not that he runs poorly on tour tracks. He just has awful luck at them. I mean, he's been taken out in three opening lap accidents at tour tracks. He had a streak there of three straight races being taken out in opening lap wrecks. And I guess the problem there is that he tends to qualify mid-pack. So he's got to step up his qualifying performance. But even last year at San Diego, I think he qualified like third. And yeah, you know, he was still taken out. So I don't know, man. I think obviously the advantage in terms of experience goes to Sean Wooden, but we've seen multiple times him be outboxed by a rookie who had no experience or limited experience at these traps in a title fight like this, i.e. Laquan Scranson, Colin Ward. So I look at that, and obviously there's a tie atop the point standings. It's incredibly close. The margins are so slim. I don't know who to pick, man. You still got the defending champ lurking back there. In fact, if I'm going to go with anyone, I'm going with Graham Darty because we've seen that he's been there. He's done that before. He qualified on pole for San Diego last year. He did what he needed to do in that race. He finished second, I believe, to Ian Adonde. So, you know, he's been there. He's done that before. He knows when when to pull out a result. He can do it. So I trust Darty the most out of anyone in this fight. Delval and Thorsten are very much unknowns and wouldn't just, it's not that he's bad in these situations, but he just hasn't done enough. I haven't seen him do enough. And we still know that his um, Ajax Super Speedway crash injuries are lingering. Now, granted, he's got the off week to kind of, rest and recalibrate so we'll see but man it's going to be interesting the final two weeks will be interesting and i hope those guys enjoy their off weeks but are preparing for what's to come these final couple races gonna be fun next up i gotta talk silly season and more and more reveals are starting to come out we're obviously getting 2026 reveals pretty much every week now this late into the season and pretty much everything's starting to fall into place. So Danny Bradford has been confirmed to the number 14 for Tico Bowden Motorsports in the 2026 season. And you may be confused. If you don't watch the Craftsman series, you may be very confused as to who the hell is Danny Bradford and why is he in a cup ride? Because you look at the standings and this guy's 13th in points and you're like, why is he in a cup right again? Oh, and to be honest with you, the answer is no one else wanted the ride. <laughs> That's the short and simple answer. Um, we're hearing reports that um, Dustin Adams and Will Moon were both offered the ride. They said no. Tika Bowden Road Sports notoriously, infamously, offered Chris Barrymore $16 million to take this ride. He said no. Obviously, goes on to Ronnie Woods Motorsports. So with all that falling through, obviously, they didn't want to keep Devin Smith for another year. We know what Smith is, and that's not good at all. He's terrible. Um, so Danny Bradford is 
the one who ends up getting the call, and that's because he was kind of booted out for Hood Motorsports because they thought they had a new prospect coming up in the wings, but that deal fell through. So I bet Bradford kind of regrets not just kind of waiting it out a little bit and saying, hmm, I don't know about this cup ride right now. I just want to see how things play out at Owen Motorsports because it's looking like they're probably going to wish he was back in the O2 next season, but we'll see. So Bradford to the 14, I I don't know, man. It's we have seen time and time again when you hire a craftsman prospect that is not a proven race winner or at least proven high up in the standings, it tends to be a disaster. And more often than not, it's Tico Bowen Moseworth hiring these craftsman prospects. And it's like, why? They have to stop doing this. We see what happens when they're able to get a Doug Bowden, um, a Ryan Braun, a Jack Bronwell, these types into the fold, they're absolutely they're actually able to bring in some stability. A Norm Luster, you know, they're actually able to bring in some stability. They're able to be competitive, but their recent revolving door of craftsman prospects, especially since they shut down their craftsman team, it's such a joke, man. And as long as they continue to hire these no names because they can't get anyone else to cover the team. Look, I get it. They tried to chase Chris Barrymore. It didn't work out. I understand they try to go for a proven commodity. But come on, it's Chris Barrymore. He was the biggest name on the open market. You're telling me they couldn't get a Cameron Barrymore in this ride. You're telling me they, um, you're telling me that Danny Bradford is a better option than a Devin Smith for another season. Who knows? Another season of develop, with development with the turbo hybrid engines. I get that Smith is awful, but the equipment is awful is also awful. You're telling me they couldn't get anyone else. You're telling me they couldn't get a Tommy Woods in here. At this point, I think I would take Tommy Woods over Danny Bradford. This is just such an uninspiring hire especially considering there's really nothing Bradford does well. Exceptionally, maybe plate race. I don't know. He's not a great road racer. I mean, he's fine. Not great at short tracks. Eh. Not great at the one-mile circuits. Not great at particularly anything. He's mediocre across the board. It's just so uninspiring. It's such a Tika about motorsports move. Um for them to just take a la- last ditch guy like that. Like they just, they would have been better off shutting the team down, honestly. If they were dis- this desperate, they should have just shut the team down. So I, I, if I had to grade this, I'd give it a D, a D minus. It's really bad. I do not approve of it at all, but that's Seek about Motorsports for you. Now, on the other hand, here's a couple hires that, I am a bit higher on and a bit more um, positive, optimistic. That's the word. A bit more optimistic about, and that's Snoot Enterprises. So obviously their former craftsman lineup, Lance Davidson, Chad Nelson has been an abject disaster. They've been awful. Davidson for three years, Nelson for two. They've been terrible. No doubt about it. They had to go. So they're both booted out. They're somehow able to convince Tax Slayer to not just return the 21, but also sponsor the two next season. So now you got Tax Slayer sponsoring both cars like a Formula One team. Um, In response to this new development, Snoots decides to bring in two young, inspiring talents to the organization. They got Calvin Terryu the third, and they got Travis Wolf. Now on Terryu, 
I'll admit, I really don't know that much about him. I believe he's 20, 21 years old, pretty young talent. Um, I actually don't know his hometown. We have to look that up after this, but um, young talent, you know, he's about a three-star prospect. Um, you know, we'll see on him. Um, but I mean, it can't be any worse than Lance Davidson at this point, let's be honest. And Chad Nelson, that's for sure. So you got to take a stab at something. And between Terry U and Drew Langston, who's about 25, another guy they had in the pipeline, I'd take Terry U any day. You want, you want that young 20 something year old driver in the pool, in the mix. So I don't mind the hire, to be honest with you. And then we got Travis Wolf on the other side. And this is a guy who's pretty much came out of nowhere. I would say about a month ago, pretty much no one in the SCA space knew who this guy was. But not even any of the teams or anything, but Snoots went to one of his dirt track races. He won. Um, this was prior to the West Coast Swing. They were incredibly impressed. They offered him a contract like the Monday after, signed him to a development deal, and then put him in the 21. He's only he's only going to be 19 years old next season from Kansas. Um, first driver from really the heart of the Midwest in the United States. Um, I like the hire, honestly. I think especially when you see what we've seen out of Colin Ward recently, these dirt track guys have a lot of potential, a lot of potential. Carson Smith's another guy that's dabbled in dirt. He's going to do some in the off season. Congrats to him on being a new father, by the way. Um, and then Ronnie with Motorsports also just hired Matt Chamberlain, another dirt track guy. So we're seeing these teams start to take some stabs in the dark in on some dirt trackers. And the raw talent that these guys possess is otherworldly. So we know that obviously Ronnie Woods Motorsports, technically Michael White Racing, but then they were dumb as hell to let him walk right to Ronnie Woods Motorsports. Um, they struck gold with Colin Ward. If you want to see Michael White Racing discovered him, fine. But obviously Ronnie Woods Motorsports are the ones that are reaping the benefits of Ward right now. So We'll give the credit to Ronnie with Motorsports. Why not? RWM, they were the ones that have really kind of transitioned us, the AC scouts, I should say, into looking into these dirt track guys and taking them all more seriously. And that's the kind of cloth that Wolf is cut from. Only 19 years of age. You like that he's young. You like that he's the same age as a Delval, a Thorson. That's who Snooze needs to respond to. They need their answer to the youth movement because you have a Greg Healy who's going to be 29 next season. He's not getting any younger, and he still hasn't even negotiated a new contract with the team, so he might not be back there long term. Who knows? So you got youth. You got much – well, you didn't get much younger than your prospects – they had before but you certainly hope they got more talented and i am much more optimistic about these hires specifically wolf i think there's a lot of untapped potential in him coming from that dirt background and we'll see how it works out but it's interesting and i'm much more optimistic like i said about this new tires than i am danny bradford to the 14 for tico bond motorsports we'll put it that way all right so, with that all taken care of, let's preview the race this week. The Apple 225 um, at the Historic Computer Motor Speedway. What to expect? Well, first, for starters, it's a day race. Not a night race like the Windows 300. So, that changes things up dramatically. Another condensed two-day weekend. But unlike the Windows 300 earlier in the season, like I mentioned last week, these guys are not really developing their cars much anymore. They really are, other than Ronnie Woods Motorsports and Rikidi Birds Racing. And they were already the guys to beat at this track 
earlier in the season. So I don't see why they wouldn't be the guys to beat at this track this time around. And specifically, I think we're going to see another battle between title protagonists or Kiwi and Kid. And let me just tell you, the fights between these guys have been much watch TV this season. There's been so many good ones, so many iconic moments we'll look back on over the years like, man, what a scrap that was between two of the best we've ever seen in the sport, um, in the prime of their careers, no less. You know, just incredible action that these two have put on. What a show. What a spectacle. And I think we're going to see more of that um, on Saturday afternoon. So I'm here for it, most certainly. I'm sure you guys are here for it, too. going to be a fun race. and. Like I said, it's going to be another war between Ronnie with Motorsports and Rikidi versus Racing, another war between Diego Rikidi and Todd Kidd. And I've got Diego battling back. He took a sucker punch to the face last week from Todd Kidd to lose like he did in that fashion after being so dominant. That's demoralizing. But if there's anyone that knows how to come back with the counterpunch in this sport, it's Diego Rikidi. I mean, there's a reason why he's won four championships. Like he knows how to respond to situations like that. So I've got Diego coming back big time with the response. Um, I certainly think that he's going to have an uphill battle competing against Ronnie Woods Motorsports, considering they do have the momentum right now. But I've got Diego getting it done. So we'll see how it goes. Certainly going to be another fun weekend of ASC action, even if there is only the cup race. I'm excited for it. And um, I certainly hope that you guys are too. So yeah, this is Charles Fallon signing out. We'll see you after a fun weekend upcoming from Computer Motor Speedway.